The linguistic similarities between Cape Verdean Creole and Papiamento has surprised and confused many people for decades. But today, I will explain how Cabo Verdiano gave rise to Papiamento. In order to understand how Papiamento began, we have to go back to the other side of the Atlantic. Papiamento started as a 17th century version of Cape Verdean Creole, implanted on Curaçao, Bonaire, and later on on Aruba by the Dutch West Indian Company. From here on out, I will refer to Cape Verdean Creole as Cabo Verdiano, the oldest Creole language consisting of Portuguese vocabulary and West African grammar of the Wolof, Mandinka, and the Temne peoples as the main influences. It began developing due to colonial ambitions of Portugal claiming and colonizing the island of Santiago in 1462 and soon transforming it into a slave society and market. And according to linguists like Nicholas Quint, Cabo Verdiano started during the early 1500s and thus forming and stabilizing on the islands of Santiago and Fo. The Portuguese were often people of low status such as Jews, vagrants and criminals, according to the records. They had made alliances on the mainlands with the various African leaders, nations that were fighting religious and commercial wars between themselves thus gaining access to the war captives of the Fulani, Wolof and Mende speaking people and importing them to the recently colonized islands as free labor. Shortly after colonizing Santiago and Fogo, the Portuguese and their enslaved Africans began respreading on the African coast to the already established Portuguese forts. Partly because of the wars in Europe led to a decrease in trade on the islands between passing merchants of other nations. Another reason for the Portuguese fleeing to the mainland is that the islands had many famines and epidemics, causing them to sell the Cabo Verdiano speaking Africans to other European powers on the African coast, such as the Dutch West India Company, a less resort as to not lose their capital. Droughts were a common theme on the Cape Verdean Islands according to David Patterson, author of Epidemics, Famines and Population in the Cape Verde Islands. So much so, that 50% of the island's population in later centuries, such as 1773, died. The Portuguese, the Free Africans and their mixed progenies were the founders of cities like Bissau and Cachil in Guinea-Bissau and the city of saint Chor in modern-day Senegal. For example, Cachil was founded in 1588 along the banks of the Cachil River. The Dutch were already in this region since 1598 as reported by a Dutch trader named Van Rijt. The navigations in Guinea had become so common that the coasts of this country were not without Dutch ships from summer to winter. These Dutchmen had a number of forts on the Petite Côte around modern-day Dakar, Senegal, a region also known as the Cape Verde Peninsula. Goree Island being the Dutch main base across the mainland, where vessels of different nations came to restock food supplies and or buy enslaved Africans. And also where the Dutch dispatched their own ships to nearby trading ports, such as in Cachil. These forts later fell under the jurisdiction of the Amsterdam Chamber of the Dutch West India Company, the same chamber that came to hold supervision on Curaçao, Bonaire and Aruba in 1634. And it was during the mid-1600s that Santiago, the main island of Cape Verde, lost its importance in the West African and transatlantic slave trade, thanks to the growing Dutch competition with Portugal over the influence over the Senegambia region, amplifying the role of migration from the islands to the West African coast. Here's a quote on the Dutch-Portuguese commercial relations. Either ships from Cachil called here, or he, the Dutch captain of Corée, would send there to Cachil his merchants to trade, and from there Goree Island, they drew wax and ivory each year, and each year two to three big ships would come here from Holland to load the mentioned merchandise which they brought to Amsterdam. And they took much profit from this island, so much that when the English took it in my time, in 1663, they did not hesitate to strike back, so that later, in the following year, General de Ruyter 
was sent with a squadron of 14 warships to retake the island, so that here we see the benefits obtained from the trade they conducted here. We also have Lemos Quilio, a Portuguese trader that also documented that the Flemish and the Dutch regulated the trade with the local Portuguese, meaning Portuguese residents of Cape Verde and their mixed offspring, as well as local Africans who spoke Portuguese. It's important to note that a big part of the Portuguese were in fact Sephardic Jews and recently converted Christians with ties to Amsterdam. And these people were active in these ports. Amsterdam during this time had received many Jews from Portugal and Spain during the religious persecution of these two nations. According to Dutch documents, Curaçao started to import enslaved Africans in major numbers around 1660. And the Dutch West India Company lost all of their forts in 1677, marking the end of the Dutch influence from Senegal to Sierra Leone, meaning that the transplant of Cabo Verdiano occurred in a 17-year period, which happens to be the peak period of Curaçao's 17th century slave trade. From 1667 until 1675, around 24,000 African enslaved people were shipped to Curaçao, as stated on the documents of the Dutch West India Company. A cause for this peak was the fact that in 1662, the Dutch West India Company had gained an exclusive contract for supplying the Spanish colonies in the Americas with enslaved Africans, a contract the Portuguese had with the Spanish, but lost. Let's read a few sources. Oh yeah, disclaimer. Cape Verde within the following quotes refers to the Cape Verdean Peninsula, which the Cape Verdean Islands were named after, basically the Senegal region. In 1659, the Dutch ship Gideon brought 28 slaves from Cape Verde Peninsula to Curaçao. The same ship was again reported as transporting slaves from the Cape Verde region to Curaçao in 1671. Matthias Beck, the governor of Curaçao between 1657 and 1668, wrote a letter to the directors of the West Indian Company in 1659, expressing his wish to bring from Cape Verde a good lot of Negroes. Castile from Curaçao transported around 200 slaves from Goree Island to Curaçao and made a second, third and fourth return trip Goree to Curaçao before returning to Amsterdam in 1676. These are a few of the rare documents linking Curaçao to Cabo Verdiano speakers during the period of the first Dutch West India Company before its bankruptcy in 1674. To make the connection even more obvious, in order to supply Curaçao, the Dutch West India Company initially relied on their post in Senegambia, since the sea currents strongly favored a sailing route from Cape Verde to the Caribbean, meaning sailing from Senegambia to Curaçao was the normal route. Also, it's important to note that the Sephardic Jews from Amsterdam, who first lived in Portugal and Spain, had family living on the Cape Verde Islands and West African coasts. These were the early settlers on Curaçao, which have been well documented in Curaçaoan history. For example, in 1650 to 1652, 12 Jewish families were given land to cultivate the interior of the island. Among those people was the Sephardic Jewish slave trader, Abraham Drago, who had been buying slaves in and from Cape Verde for years. The same Abraham Drago was one of the first Jews to settle on Curaçao in 1651. He had two ships, one which he partially owned with David Nassi, another founding father of the Curaçaoan Jewish community, Tindir's Manuel Correa, which after purchasing slaves in Cachil, anchored at Corea and then crossed the Atlantic towards the Antilles. The same Manuel Correa was a Sephardic Jew with family ties to Amsterdam and had become active in the slave trade after settling on Curaçao in the 1670s. Curaçao during this time was a market where enslaved Africans were resold to other islands. Which begs the question, which Africans were chosen to be kept on the island? The probable reasons according to Bart Jacobs, a linguist from the Frank Martino School of Thought is that the enslaved Africans from the Cape Verde Islands and their descendants in Cachil 
were already accustomed to the inhumanity of chattel slavery, since those Africans had been living with Portuguese masters for over 150 years already. Another reason might be the preference for light-skinned slaves, favoring the selection of the racially mixed and thus generally lighter-skinned slaves from the Cape Verde region. A third reason why Cabo Verdiano speaking slaves may have been more in demand is the very fact that they spoke Upper Guinea Creole, the linguistic name of Cabo Verdiano. One can easily imagine that if the Dutch or Sephardic Jewish settlers were to pick one slave out of ten, they would pick the one with whom they could communicate more readily. It's important to note that the Dutch could also speak Spanish and Portuguese during the Middle Ages. Reason number four. Although many of the Dutch settlers of Curaçao were Protestants, there must have been tolerance towards Catholicism within the ranks of the Dutch West Indian Company. Judging from the fact that it had Portuguese and Spanish Catholics in its service, preferring someone accustomed with Christianity rather than practitioners of African spirituality. All of this fits into the puzzle that makes Papio Mintu a descendant of Cabo Verdiano which is the reason that to this day, speakers of Papiamento, modern Cabo Verdiano and Guinea-Bissau Creole can easily learn each other's language and understand a simple conversation. Yo guys, if you love this video, smash the like button and share this video. Don't forget to subscribe and let me know in the comments if you think that Guinea-Bissau Creole deserves its own video. So again, in conclusion, it's time to remember what we have forgotten.